morning, church. Let's stand and worship the King.
Treasure waits within your 
our scars. This gift of freedom gold can buy. I bought the world and sold my heart. You traded heaven to have me again. My heart beating, my soul beating. I found my life, my native town. A word falling. Spirit soaring, I touch the skies when my knees hit the ground. Find me here at your feet again, everything I am, reaching out, I surrender. Father, open up our hearts, put us in a posture to be humble before you today. Thank you for the gift of unity in your spirit and with each other here. Amen. 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 Good morning. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Love that last song. It's a great message. Hope you guys have had a good week. Thank you for coming and wanted to just tell you once again, I love you. I'm grateful for each and every time that you come and worship with us and, and how you support our church. It's a huge blessing. So thank you. Well, today we're going to be in Daniel chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles, please go ahead and turn there. We're going to be getting to that passage in just a second. But please understand that these final three chapters really all go together. They make up Daniel's final dream. Chapter 10 contains a description of Daniel's perception of the dream. Chapter 11 includes the angel's explanation of the dream. And chapter 12 marks God's final instructions to Daniel regarding the dream. Big picture here of these final three ch chapters is that God is intending to give his people then and now hope and confidence during difficult days. And we find ourselves living in difficult days. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen? And God wants us to have hope and confidence and trust in Him. And so that's really what we're going to see over the next three weeks as we look at these final three chapters. Because that's the big picture. Now, prior to this final dream that Daniel had, King Cyrus of Persia had allowed by this time 40,000 Jews to return back to Jerusalem. I mentioned that last week. It was on his dime. He said, okay, you can go back three separate groups to rebuild Jerusalem, its walls, and the temple. Daniel, however, was not one of those 40,000. Daniel, because of his age and his responsibilities, was still in Babylon. So let's get to our text. Verse 1, please read along with me. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia... Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, had another vision. He understood that the vision concerned events 
certain to happen in the future. Times of war and great hardship. Now, it's also important for us to remember when we're reading chapter 10 that these events that Daniel's talking about are past for Daniel. He's looking back and he's recounting things. And in verse 1, he tells us that this particular dream is about war and great hardship for his people. Look at verse 2 with me. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. I didn't eat any rich food. No meat or wine entered my mouth. And I didn't put any oil on my body until the three weeks were over. So why is he doing this? Well, he tells us there in verse 2, he is in mourning. He's not interested in self-gratification. On the contrary, he is sad. And this is very interesting because this would have been counter to what was happening around him during this time. In fact, these three weeks of mourning interestingly take place during two Jewish holidays. The Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread. And so everybody around him is celebrating and yet he is mourning. His heart's heavy. Have you ever been mourning while the world around you was celebrating? See, that was Daniel's situation. So why is he sad? Well, first of all, he's sad because this current dream that God has given him literally meant hard times and war were coming for his people. And that war heavy on his heart. Second, he's grieving because these 40,000 Jews that were allowed to return to Jerusalem were facing massive opposition. And this opposition was taking a toll on the people. It was wearing them down. And not only that, it was hindering their progress of rebuilding Jerusalem, rebuilding the walls, and rebuilding the temple. That was discouraging. And then third, Daniel's nearly 90 years old, and guess where he's still at? Babylon. Captivity is long over. Many of his people have already returned, but again, Daniel is not one of them. Certainly he would have liked to gone home instead of just remaining in a foreign country. And so this definitely makes him sad. Let's keep reading in verse 4. On April 23rd, as I was standing on the bank of the great Tigris River, I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. Only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified and ran away to hide. I was left alone looking at this great vision. No strength was left in me. My face grew deathly pale and I was powerless. Then I heard the man speak. And when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. All right, so let's recap. Daniel's had this final dream. He understands that it's about Israel's future and it's not good. And he's troubled because of it. No doubt, as we saw in chapter 9 a few weeks ago, Daniel's praying. Daniel's repenting and he's seeking God's mercy for himself and for his nation. Daniel wants to understand what these prophecies are all about. He wants to receive the understanding before he dies. Why? Because he wants to leave behind something that will encourage and strengthen his people. And oh, that that may be said of us. That we would want to leave something behind during our earthly journey. For the people that are going to come after us. The kind of thing that will encourage and lift them up. And so we see here in the text. says on April 23rd that while Daniel was standing by the Tigris River. He's visited by these heavenly messengers. Which further terrifies him, as you can imagine. Not only that, but we see that while his companions didn't see anything or hear anything, we are told that they feel the presence of a spiritual entity and it terrifies them and so they run off to hide. Daniel says, literally all my strength left me 
and my face grew deathly pale. And he says that when this messenger spoke to him, that he passes smooth out, face down on the ground. So imagine the situation. Many scholars tell us that this description um, that's described there in verses 4 through 6 is a theophany. The reason they think it's a theophany is because it's very similar to the description that the Apostle John gives in Revelation chapter 1. A theophany is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And so they could be right. Now, personally, I, I don't think that. I lean towards it being um, just another angel, but more on that la later. And so let's keep reading in our text in verse 10. Suddenly a hand touched me and raised me to my hands and knees. And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up, for I've been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up still trembling. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven, and I have come in answer to your prayer. And so just like last week when Daniel was visited by an angel, he's told some things. And so here in the text, he's told first that he is very precious to God. I want you to think about that for a minute. This angel is sent to encourage and to remind Daniel, you are very precious to God. J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, said, What matters supremely, therefore, is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God but the larger fact which underlies it, that he knows me. I'm graven on the palms of his hands. I'm never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me, and there is no moment when his eye is off me. Or his attention distracted from me. And no moment, therefore, when his care falters. This is momentous knowledge. This is unspeakable comfort. It's comfort in knowing that God is constantly taking knowledge of me in love and watching over me for my good. There is tremendous relief in knowing that his love is utterly realistic. Based at every point on prior knowledge about the worst of me. So that no discovery now could disillusion him about me in the way that I'm so often disillusioned about myself. Nothing can quench his determination to bless me. That's a wonderful quote there by J.I. Packer reminding us that just like Daniel, just like he was treasured by God, that you and I as children of God are treasured by God. I want you to know this morning that you are loved. I want that to really sink in because the fact of the matter is we're going through some difficult days. Some of you have a lot of personal things going on in your life and you may not feel very loved. But I want you to know that God's message for you today is that you are loved. That He treasures you. That you're important to Him. So much so that He was willing to send His own Son to die for you. And that's how much He cares. Second, Daniel is told here that this angel had been sent to specifically answer his prayer. Third, the angel tells Daniel, listen carefully to God's words. No, that's a good message for us today. Listen carefully. Fourth, the angel says, don't be afraid. Now, honestly, I could just stop right there and we could preach those four things today. Because those things are still relevant right now. Because you are loved by God. God does hear your prayers. God has angels working on them. God will answer them. So when your time of difficulty comes, and maybe you're going through it right now, I want you to remember, just like the angel told Daniel, you need to listen carefully to the words of God. Remembering those things, that you are loved, that He does hear you, that He has angels working on your prayer requests. And remember the fact that He's told you not to be afraid. Remember who it is who holds the future. He's sovereign. He's in control and you can trust Him. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. 
But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. This is what one of the angelic beings is saying to Daniel. He's saying, I was hindered by the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me. And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I have come to help you understand what will happen to your people in the last days. For the vision refers to those days. Now this is also very interesting and I don't know if it caught your attention. But this is why I personally do not believe that one of these heavenly beings was Jesus. Because here in verse 13, this, this heavenly being says that he needed help from the archangel Michael to overcome the spirit prince of Persia. If it were the Lord Jesus Christ who is God, he wouldn't have needed any help. I want you to also notice here uh, the phrase spirit prince of Persia. Maybe you're wondering what that's all about. Looking at the text, looking at the context, this is referring to a demon. Just like God has organization with how his angels interact with mankind, so does Satan. As a matter of fact, Ephesians 2.2 2 calls Satan the commander of the powers of the unseen world. The spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Don't forget that when Satan was cast out of heaven, one third of all of the angels went with him. And so those demons now presently fight against God and his heavenly angelic army. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us all about this spiritual warfare because this is what is being described here in verses 13 and 14 is that there is spiritual warfare going on between the angels of God and the demons of Satan. Listen to how Ephesians 6 describes spiritual warfare. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes. Put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will fully be prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And so, whether you realize it or not, there is a great spiritual warfare going on all around us. And this is what the angel is revealing to Daniel. So back to our text in verses 13 and 14. Daniel's made aware of this knowledge of the spiritual warfare and it floors him. This vision and its understanding, he tells us, has made him feel helpless, unworthy, and without strength. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 15. While he was speaking to me, I looked at the ground, unable to say a word, and suddenly one with human likeness touched my lips. This is the other angelic being. He says, I opened my mouth and said to the one standing in front of me, My Lord, because of the vision, anguish overwhelms me and I am powerless. How can someone like me, your servant, talk to you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Now this is not uncommon. Just look through the scriptures. When people encounter spiritual beings, it causes very similar physical reactions. It's when the Mortal encounters the immortal. The physical encounters the spiritual. This is what happens. It takes a toll on our finite bodies. Verse 18, keep reading. Then the one with a human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. Don't be afraid, he said, for you are very precious to God. There it is a second time. Peace 
Be encouraged. Be strong. And as he spoke these words to me, I suddenly felt stronger and said to him, Please speak to me, my Lord, for you have strengthened me. And I love that. And I hope that you don't miss the significance of what's happening here in the text. Because this is what the word of God will do for you. Remember, Daniel was feeling weak, faint. But as he began to hear the words of God and the words of God found a place in his heart and his mind, he got stronger. See, this is what the word of God will do for you. It will give you strength. It will take away your fear and it will replace it with faith. The word of God will encourage you. That's why we need it so much. If you look around all the things that's going around us and you don't put yourself in the word of God, you're going to feel very discouraged. You need the word of God. A little nine-year-old boy got tired of practicing the piano, so his mother heard that the great Paderewski was coming into town for a concert, she bought two tickets, one for him and one for her. And so they got there. She sat him down there in his little tuxedo and immediately started talking with her friends. And his little eyes started wandering the whole auditorium. And he noticed the stage. And there on the stage was this giant Ebony Black Steinway concert grand piano. And the lid was temptingly open. And he looked at it and he thought, man, I'd like to play that. So he popped his knuckles Snuck away down the aisle, walked up the front, climbed the stairs, sat down, and started playing chopsticks. Of course, everybody noticed. A hush grew on the crowd. They started wondering, who is this kid? Where's his mom? Where's his parents? Of course, his mother noticed, and she's embarrassed. But the great Paderewski also noticed. He was in the back fixing his tie. He heard what was going on. So without the boy seeing he snuck up behind him, reached around him, and improvised a beautiful melody to go with chopsticks. And then he said to the boy, don't quit. Keep playing. Don't stop. And listen, this is what God does for us. When we're struggling, when we're in situations, God wants to come and reach around you and whisper in your ear, don't quit. Keep playing. He wants to encourage you. And that's what God does through his word. Look at verse 20 of our text. He replied... Do you know why I've come? Soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. Meanwhile, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one helps me against these spirit princes except Michael, your spirit prince. Verse 21 reminds us of a few things that were mentioned in verses 1 and verse 14. First of all, look back at verse 1. We see that in the third year of King Cyrus's reign, Daniel has this vision, and he understands that the vision, vision concerns events certain to happen in the future. I want you to underline that. These events are about the future. Verse 14. Now I've come to help you understand what will happen to your people in the last days. For the vision refers to those days. And you might underline that. Again, this vision is about the future for Daniel. And it's about days of war and great hardship for the Jews. This messenger also says that these things are already written down in the book of truth. Now, what in the world is the book of truth? What well, could be a reference to the Bible in these prophecies. Or it could be a separate book that God has. And God is so confident that the things are going to happen just as he said they would. That he's already written them down. In advance. God is sovereign over history. Amen? Amen? He's sovereign. He's in control. We may not know about tomorrow, but we know who holds tomorrow. So what are our takeaways from chapter 10? I hope you'll find somewhere and you'll write these down. What are our takeaways? How does this apply to us today? Well, just like last week, I want you to remember that you are precious to God. He loves you. He doesn't love you because you go to church, because you pray, or because you read the Bible. God's love is not based on conditions. Now, everybody around us, while we might try to love unconditionally, it's a struggle for us. Human love is just plagued by conditional love. It's what have you done for me, right? And not just what have you done for me, but what have you done for me lately? 
But that's not God's love. God loves you. You are precious to Him. He chooses to love you because He chooses to love you. Nothing can change that. I want you to also remember, you can write this down, that God hears your prayers. He hears you when you pray to Him. You're not just praying to an empty room, just saying meaningless words. No, He is listening. And that ought to encourage you to want to pray more. I don't know about you, but sometimes when you have a relationship with someone and they are a very good listener, you can just tell from their facial expression or maybe they're not even looking at you. You can tell they probably really aren't listening and this may not completely be true, but maybe they don't care. And usually when that happens, you don't want to open up as much. But God listens to you and God hears you, so that ought to make you want to communicate more with Him. I want you to remember that He has angels working on them for you. He cares. I want you to remember that there is spiritual warfare going on all around us. Behind every human, political, and international affair is the work of angels and demons. Conflicts on earth reflect conflicts in the heavens. Remember the words of Ephesians 6, 11-13. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So that's the reality. So what are we supposed to do with it? Well, verse 13 tells us, put on every piece of God's armor so that you can resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. I hope you'll go ahead for just a second. I want you to take out your phones. Go ahead and get them. Hopefully you have already... Downloaded the YouVersion Bible app on your phone. But if you have, I want you to open up that app for just a second because I want to encourage you to select a Bible study plan on the armor of God. And I will be doing it along with you. If you open up the YouVersion Bible app, down at the bottom you'll see a button that says Plans. And then once you find that Plans button, I want you to select it and I want you to find there's a little... My, uh, like a magnifying glass. It's a search button. And in that search bar, I want you to type in 8-Day Armor of God Boot Camp. Again, 8-Day Armor of God Boot Camp. This is a Bible study by Dr. Tony Evans. It's a great Bible study on the armor of God. Again, it's called 8-Day Armor of God Boot Camp. And I encourage you to select that study and to do it. It will teach you all about the armor of God and how to put it on. And as you spend time in God's word, let me remind you to listen carefully. Don't just listen, but apply it. Remember what James chapter 1 tells us? Don't be just hearers of God's word, but be doers of it. God never intended to just tell us his word so we'd say, oh, it's good to know. <laughs> Just like when you talk to your spouse or you talk to your kids, you're not just merely talking to them sometimes. You expect there to be a reaction. Hey, I told you to clean your room. Yeah, that was great. That was a great thing for you to tell me, Mom. Hey, go do it. Right? So take advantage of YouVersion Bible app. There's so many wonderful Bible studies and devotions on it. And this one specifically about the armor of God. It'd be wonderful if our church could collectively walk through this together. Learning how to put on the armor of God because there is spiritual warfare all around, around us. And the word of God will bring healing. Healing when you're hurt. Peace when you're troubled. Strength when you feel weak. God's word will make you stronger. It will encourage you. And it will take away fear. And it will replace it with faith. You know how Romans chapter 10 tells us faith comes? Faith comes from the hearing of and the hearing of God's word. So as you hear it, and as you hear it again, and as you hear it some more, and you hear it again, then faith replaces that fear in your heart. Have you ever heard of the story about the mutiny on the bounty? 
The bounty was a boat back in 1787, an English boat, and they decided they would sail to the South Seas. Those on board were commissioned by their authorities to spend time on those islands transplanting fruit-bearing and food-bearing trees and doing other things to make the islands more habitable. Well, after 10 months of voyage, they arrived safely, and for six months, they completely gave themselves to that task of getting it more habitable. Well, when that six months was over and the task was completed, the orders came to embark again. But guess what? The sailors rebelled. Now, this is interesting because there's actually a movie to this. Anthony Hopkins and Mel Gibson is in this movie. It's an older movie, but it kind of tells this story. But as Hollywood often does, it leaves out some of the really important details. But what happened is these men rebelled because they had formed strong attachment to the native girls. Not only that, they really enjoyed the ease of South Sea life and they liked the climate. And so the result was rebellion and a mutiny on the bounty. And so the soldiers basically captured their captain and a few of the local men and they set them in uh, the, the boat there and kind of had them out adrift there. Their captain was Captain Bly and fortunately for him, he was rescued, he survived, he made his way back to London, he told his story and so an expedition was launched to go and punish the mutineers. They arrive, 14 of the guys are captured and pay the penalty under British law, but nine of the men had escaped to a nearby distant island. And there they formed a colony, perhaps there has never been a more ungodly and debauched island probably in all of history. They learned to distill whiskey from a native plant. As it usually happens with alcohol, it leads to a bunch of foolishness. And they were obviously... Uh, Guilty of many more ungodly sins. And it took its toll. It led to their demise. Disease and murder took the lives of all of the native men. And only one of the original nine crew members survived. And his name was Alexander Smith. He found himself the only man surrounded by a crowd of women and children. Fortunately, I say it's a blessing of God, he found a Bible among the possessions of one of the dead soldiers. And the Bible was new to him. He had never read it. But he decided, I'm going to read it. And so he made a commitment to read through the Bible and began to transform his life and he became a believer. He began to read it and believe it and to appropriate its teachings to his life. And it was so exciting to him that he wanted to share it with those on the island. And so he started having classes for these women and children, reading them God's Word, teaching them the Scriptures. Twenty years later, a ship did eventually find that island, and when it did, it found an amazing society. People were living in decency and prosperity and harmony and peace. Crime and disease and immorality and insanity and illiteracy was very, very low. And how was this accomplished? Again, this is not what the movie will show you. How was this accomplished? It was accomplished by the reading, the believing, and the appropriating of the Word of God in their lives. See, that's the power of the Word of God. So I encourage you, don't forget the Word of God. It needs to be a regular part of your life. Also, please remember to pray. I think the neglect of prayer is the reason why so many churches and so many individual believers are so weak. And defeated. Yesterday, I don't know if you were aware, but there was a great thing that took place in Washington. It was uh, a day of prayer. And there was more than 50,000 people there praying. You can actually go and, and catch it. I think it's a two and a half hour event. Uh, you can catch it on channel TBN is what it is. Uh, but Dr. Uh, uh, Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, put it all together. And it was a great time of prayer. I, and it's... It's so wonderful because there were seven stops along their journey, uh, kind of at different sites there in Washington. And each spot they prayed for something specifically. And they made intercession uh, to God for our country and for so many different things within our country. So I encourage you to check that out. But it was an importance of prayer. And prayer is so important. I don't think we really understand how important it is. If you look back to the passage we read today. 
Daniel 10, if you look back to the passages on spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, you are going to see prayer is right there in the mix. Because it's a weapon. It's a mighty weapon that we use to accomplish God's purposes. Evangelist Billy Sunday said, Much prayer, much power. No prayer, no power. Let that sink in. Jesus himself said that demonic forces and really this spiritual warfare that's around us can only be defeated by prayer and by fasting. Which, by the way, if you think back to our text, those were the very activities that Daniel was doing in verse 2. During those three weeks, he was seeking the face of God. Chapter 9 tells us that part of his regular process was fasting. Remember, he said, I didn't eat these things and I didn't do these, drink these things. Fasting, denying himself so he could focus on God and really reach the heart of God. And prayer is so important. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us this. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey God. That's again what prayer can accomplish. It's a spiritual weapon that we use as believers as we see things going on around us and in our own lives. And then I want you to remember not to be afraid. I want you to choose hope rather than fear. Why? Because God is sovereign. God is in control of the future. You can trust Him. Maybe you're struggling with that though. I'm reminded as I close in 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha and his young servant are surrounded by enemy soldiers. Soldiers that had been sent there to kill them. And this young servant is flipping out. I mean, he is going off what he just sees with his own human eyes. And what he sees doesn't look good. So he's scared. And Elisha prays a little six-word prayer. Oh God, open his eyes. Let him see. And immediately the Bible tells us that he was able to see the heavenly realm. And he saw still the enemy soldiers surrounding them, but surrounding all of it were horses and chariots of fire and angels surrounding them. Elisha said, there's more with us than this with them. And that's what we need to realize today. We are on the winning team. Amen. God is greater than all things. And so instead of being dominated by fear as you look towards the future, listen, have hope. God's got this. But in the meantime, we still need to pray. We need to walk with God. We need to model Christian integrity. And we need to live like Jesus. And let other people see that. And it's going to make such a difference. When we do all those things collectively as individuals and as a body of Christ. Would you bow your head with me? God, I thank you so much for your word. Word is so amazing, God. Even when we get into passages, God, that are a little more difficult to make sense of, Lord, you still have something for us that's relevant because this book is alive. It is your word. Lord, it is able to speak to our hearts and mind and to show us ourselves like a mirror, God. It's, it's like a hammer in that it can break up the hardness of our hearts and the sin in our lives. Lord, it's like water. It can clean us and purify us. Lord, it's like air because we breathe it in. As we read it in God, it just gives us strength, vitality. Your word is so important and we thank you for it today. God, I pray that the words that have been spoken today would touch hearts. I pray that your Holy Spirit has been working in the hearts this morning, not only of the people that are here, but of the people that are watching online. 
God, what I believe is that there are some people today that just need to be reminded as Daniel was. Because Daniel obviously struggled with this. That's why you reminded him on multiple occasions, Daniel, you are loved. You are treasured. You are precious to God. God, I believe there's some people here today and they're feeling very unloved. They feel lonely in this world. And if they belong to you, God, I pray they would understand that they are loved and cherished and precious to you. And I pray that would give them a God esteem. Understanding that one, they are made in his image. They are his creation. And two, they are born into his family. They are his child. God, as I think about how I love and how precious my children are to me. And to multiply that by millions. We still aren't close to the depths of your love that you have for each and every one of us. So today I pray that you would wrap your arms around your people, that they would feel your love. I pray they would be encouraged today by your word and they would realize that that you hear their prayers and that you will answer their prayers in your way and in your time. In the meantime, God, you have your angelic beings working things out for our good and for your glory. Know how we need to listen carefully to your words because there is a spiritual battle going on in this country right now. And it's been going on for many years. It seems, God, as we look around like the enemy is prevailing. But God, I pray that you would help us to remember that if we know you, we are on the winning team. God, I pray that we would not fear, but we would have faith. And I pray that we would seek your face. We would humble ourselves. We would turn from our wicked ways. We would call out to you and that God, you would bring healing and revival to the churches in this country. And to every person who names the name of Christ. Lord, that we would wake up and we would shake out of our sleep. And our love for this world and love for sin. And that we would wake up and realize that, Lord... These things that we're studying and we're reading about will happen just as you say because you are in control. God, I pray we would take advantage of every minute that we have of life in this world that we would witness for you. That we would live in such a way that people could see that you are inside of us. I pray, God, that we wouldn't be infected with racism or hatred or any kind of negative thing. God, that would deter people from from you because they see us. Pray that we would bring you honor, God, in everything we say and do, in all of our relationships, in all of our interactions. God, I pray that we would remember that people are watching us. They're looking at our social media and they're looking at our lives and they're listening to our words and they all are important. They all have to do with our testimony. And God, we need to have a righteous testimony. And may we guard against anything that would come to attack that. May we be people on our knees, God. People of the book. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Corey, or maybe you're watching online and you'd say, listen. Listen. I've never received Christ as my Savior. Well, listen, God loves you too. And that's why He sent His Son to die on the cross for you. And right there where you're at, I just want to encourage you. Turn to Him. Put your faith and trust in Him. Turn away from your sin and from yourself. And come to God. Cry out to God and say, God, forgive me. God, save me. I need you in my life. God, I'm tired of living in fear and I want to have hope. I want to experience peace. And if that's you today, listen, just call out to Him. Say, God, forgive me. God, save me. And God will. Tell Him you believe in Christ and what He accomplished for you on the cross. Welcome Him into your life to lead you and to guide you. And He will. Whatever is going on in your heart right now, I just want to give you a moment while the music plays to just talk to God about that. Maybe you're here in the service today and you need to come down to these steps and you need to pray. 
Maybe you need to repent from some sin in your life. Maybe you need to turn away from the negative attitude that's been in your life for a long time. I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, these next few moments are so that you can talk to God. Let's do that. Let's pray now. Let's all stand our feet. Let's complete our worship. Let's sing this as a prayer to God.
a special thank you to all of those that came out yesterday for our outreach event. We passed out Bibles and snow cones, and we prayed for some folks, and uh, it was a great time. And we have some other outreach events coming up here in the future. Uh, the next one that I'm aware of is on the 31st of October, and instead of doing our traditional trunk or treat, we're still trying to come up with something, but kind of where we're leaning right now is uh, kind of like a hayride event that we would do in the back here, have different stops along the way, tell the gospel story, and give out some candy and stuff. And there will be lots for you to get involved in as well for that. So more information to come. We'll probably have a meeting after services next week. So if you're interested in helping with that, please just stick around and we'll get right to it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all of our visitors this morning. We love you. And it's just been a blessing to worship with you this morning. So you have a great afternoon. I'm going to ask Steve to close us in a word of prayer. And then these first two rows can go out this front door right here. And the, the remaining uh, people that are left in the back can go out the double doors right there. Go ahead, Steve. Father, well, we thank you for today. For the opportunity we've had to come together and fellowship. To sing your praises and to hear your word proclaimed. Father, well, we do thank you for the blessings that you give to us, that you provide for us each day. Father, well, we thank you that you love us, and that you care about everything else. Well. Father, help us to look to you for direction, for answers to our lives' questions, for the things that you would have us to do in your name, and the support of your kingdom. Father, well, I just thank you for each one that's here. We pray for those that we're able to come today. We ask your blessings on all of us this week as we go out and proclaim your message to the world through our actions and our deeds. For our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you. You're dismissed.